Good afternoon and thank you for joining this webinar from Yellowstone Advisory. Today's company presenting is Tullow Oil, who released their fully results on the 8th of March. And with us today are Rahul Deer, the CEO, and Richard Miller, the CFO. I'd like to hand over to Rahul to start today's uh, presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Alex, and uh, a very good morning, or I guess it's now afternoon to, um, to all of you. Uh, it's maybe just a brief reflection. I think when I joined Tullow back in 2020, and I think some of you may recall that things looked pretty bleak for us at that time, um, but you know, we had conviction in the quality of the asset base, and we had the belief that with focus and discipline, uh, we would turn the business around and unlock the underlying value in the business. And uh, that conviction, I think, has been validated by our strong and operating and, and financial performance last year. Uh, we're now creating value, generating free cash flow. Uh, the balance sheet is much stronger, is with significant liquidity. Uh, headroom and then we've got, we've got leverage of less than one and a half times. So on the operating front as well, we've had our second successive year of uh, top quartile safety performance. Um, when you look at the implementation of our investment plans, uh, that's delivering very significant economic prosperity to our host nations. And importantly, uh, we've got a really strong and diverse uh, leadership team. It's a, with, along with a very energized organization. Uh, the thing that I'm particularly proud of is there's a deep commitment to delivering on the business plan. And this is kind of going beyond the call of duty in terms of delivering excellence. Uh, and you can see the evidence of that uh, last year in the successful preemption uh, on part of the Oxy Cosmos deal and the transition of the operation and maintenance. Uh, on the Jubilee FPS, I'll talk more about that. And of course, our top quartile did great performance. So I think 23, uh, you know, notwithstanding the external market environment, I think 23 for Tullow will be an exciting year as the results of our strategy become even more visible. Uh, for instance, importantly, we'll uh, achieve over 100,000 barrels a day of gross production at Jubilee in the second half once the Jubilee Southeast infrastructure is installed. And uh, I think some of you may remember Jubilee was at 70,000 barrels a day at the end of 2020. Uh, and I think Richard, uh, Richard will share that it will, will give you more color, but the step up in production will drive very material cash generation uh, from the second half. And that increases not only our ability to repay debt, but also in, uh, it results in material equity value accretion. So that's the kind of cash flow story. But in addition to that, we've got some very important catalysts that will drive further value. And these include uh, this long-term uh, gas sales agreement in Ghana, uh, the, the submission of a revised plan of development for 10, uh, the approval of the field development plan for Kenya, as well as a strategic farm out, uh, and then monetization of the very large prospective resource base. So if you look back over the last sort of two and a half, three years, we've been working hard to create a very unique platform for growth uh, within the oil and gas sector. And I think it's gratifying to see that strategy being played out successfully. That's a quick introduction for me. Let me hand over to Richard and then I'll come back at the end. Thanks. Cool. Um, thank you, um, Rahul, uh, and good afternoon all. Um, it's a pleasure to take you through uh, a strong set of financial results for 2022, plus our sort of longer term financial outlook. Um, so if I start with 2022, um, we had an uh, exceptional operational performance through high uptime and our focused investment in our high quality producing asset base has driven our financial performance. On a like for like basis, if you exclude the impact of the assets that we disposed of uh, in 21, um, production is up 6% despite a planned shutdown of, in Jubilee in the first half of 22. This increase in production combined with higher oil prices um, drove close to a 40% increase in revenue. And that's despite a $319 million payout under our hedge program. Um, we've continued our relentless focus on our costs, um, which has enabled us to keep our operating costs flat and further reduce GNA, despite the in inflationary environment that we're seeing. Um, we've also continued to invest in our asset base, increasing CapEx by close to 100 million to $354 million. Our allocation of CapEx has continued to focus on our high volume of short payback, high return opportunities, 
with close to 90% of our capex allocated to our producing assets. Um, we also invested $126 million in Ghana preemption transaction, um, which paid for itself within nine months and will underpin the future production growth of the company. Um, following a sustained period of investment, um, we've seen the cash flow potential of the business. Um, we delivered $267 million of free cash flow uh, last year, um, which all included the impact of the legacy Norway arbitration payment and also the purchase price for Ghana preemption. This means over the last two years since we reset the business, we've delivered over $500 million of free cash flow. And at the same time, we've invested $750 million in organic and inorganic opportunities. Um, this has uh, enabled us to accelerate our deleveraging, hitting our gearing target of below 1.5 times, three years ahead of our original plan. Our guidance for 23 uh, remains unchanged from the January trading update, with $400 million invested in our asset base, delivering $100 million of free cash flow at $80 a barrel, or $200 million at $100 a barrel. This will enable us to get to around one times gearing by year end, or by the end of 24, if oil prices remain around $80 a barrel. Uh, however, as uh, projects don't really run to calendar years, this really only partially tells the story, which I'll cover on the next slide. So the Jubilee Southeast project, which we will describe shortly, really does transform the cash flow generation capacity of the business, which the graph on the left tries to demonstrate. This plots Tullow's quarterly profiles of production, capex, and decommissioning expenditure, expenditure across 23. In the first half of 2023, we'll spend over $100 million completing the infrastructure and commissioning of the Jubilee Southeast project. Following first oil, which will be around mid-year, we'll see a material uplift in production as we move into the second half of the year. These factors combine to result in a material uplift in free cash flow from mid this year, which can be sustained through into 24. The graph on the right illustrates our hedge program. We have 65% downside protection in the first half of 23. And as we move into the second half, we retain solid downside protection at 40%, but also increased exposure to a rising oil price environment. So if we move on to costs, uh, over the past five years, we've transformed our cost base. We've seen 30% reductions in OPEX and delivered 60% reductions in GNA. Our continued focus on OPEX, which is supported by the O&M transformation project, has enabled us to reduce our unit OPEX in Ghana to $9 a barrel in 23. In terms of GNA, we're forecasting a fourth consecutive year of reductions. And this is driven by our emphasis on continuous improvement with a focus on how we can do things ever more effectively and efficiently. Since we set ourselves a GNA reduction target in mid 2020, we've delivered over $300 million in cash savings. These actions across both OPEX and GNA are really important as um, to offset some of the inflationary pressures we see in the industry at the moment. So on this next slide, I'll take, take us through the more medium term outlook of the business. If we just look at the, to, um, the 2P core asset, that opportunity set that we've got, we'll see another $1.1 billion invested in our assets over the next three years. And this will generate over $800 million of free cash flow at $80 a barrel, which could increase to over $1.5 billion at $100 a barrel. This is all on a 2P basis and it excludes the highly accretive impacts of the key catalyst, which Rahul will describe. In addition to the base plan, and as a reminder, we have material upside from contingent payments linked to previous divestments. If you take the Uganda payment, um, with first oil targeted in 2025, plateau production of 230 KBD, um, this will deliver a significant additional revenue stream for the group that we've not included in any long-term guidance. Uh, the group is also potentially due to receive up to $40 million aggregate contingent consideration from the EG inducible assets we disposed of last year. So what does this all mean for our refinancing plans? Uh, at year end, we had an audited 2P MPV, so asset value of 3.9 billion. Our net debt position was 1.9 billion and we had over $1.1 billion of liquidity. Our de next debt maturity is not until March 25, uh, ahead of this, as you can see from the graph, we'll generate material free cash flow and be at one times gearing. 
Therefore, uh, our conclusion is we have time, we have an ever improving financial position and we have a number of options to address our debt maturities on an opportunistic basis. So in summary, Tullow continues to deliver both operationally and financially with like for like production, revenue, EBITDAX and profits up year on year. We've maintained our disciplined approach to capital allocation and cost management, which creates a clear pathway for Tullow to deliver significant free cash flow from mid this year. With the ongoing investment in our assets, delivery of the key catalysts, I'm confident that we'll maintain or even enhance our gross asset value. <clears throat> with material deleveraging and the refinancing of our debt, we'll provide a material equity accretion for shareholders. And with that, I'll uh, hand back to Rahul. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I think let me start with really sort of um, a, the sense of purpose that the company has, which is really we're building a better future uh, through <clears throat> responsible oil and gas developers. So what does that mean? It means a few things. Firstly, we're actively investing in social programs across our positions uh, with the aim to really make a meaningful impact uh, working with the communities where we operate. Just give you one example, we've invested uh, in programs that support over 6,000 students across our host nations uh, with STEM scholarships and education support. Uh, the other important aspect of this is, is really building local content. And if I look back over the last <coughs> five years, sorry, uh, we've invested about $1.2 billion in our businesses through local companies. Um, our business also delivers very material value to our host nations. So last year, for example, we delivered across our host nations in taxes and royalties, uh, nearly half a billion dollars. Uh, the other side, of course, is the focus on net zero. As you probably know, we committed to net zero on our scope one, scope two emissions by 2030. That's really driven by two big things. One is uh, a very active decarbonization, <clears throat> is reducing things like flaring on our two FPSOs in Ghana. And then the second one, which we're super excited about, is uh, a nature-based carbon offset project in Ghana where we, we signed an MOU, a letter of intent actually, uh, late last year, and we're hoping to take FID uh, this year. Uh, let me move on then to <clears throat> our reserves and resource uh, base. So the combined kind of 2P and 2C uh, reserve resource base is about 830 million barrels and of oil equivalent. And that's really key. That's what kind of creates this unique asset base and underpins the future growth uh, of the business. And we're actively managing this uh, a kind of a hopper from resource to reserves to production. If you look at the two P reserves uh, from last year, it's been relatively flat at about 230 million barrels uh, of oil equivalent. Uh, the two C resource base is also pretty substantial. That's at over 600 million barrels. And this has been again, relatively flat from last year. And, and this is the key that provides the replenishment uh, potential for the reserve base. There are opportunities to organically increase both the reserves and the resources in the near term uh, that would come from gas commercialization in Ghana. Um, other things have been, we had encouraging well results in the Jubilee Southeast where we discovered a new horizon sort of going deeper into the Jubilee Southeast wells. Um, in, the, in the business in Gabon, uh, for example, we are <coughs> working on development plans for Vamba where there's an existing uh, uh, well test underway. So this is all being worked in and evaluated. As Richard indicated, production in 22 grew to at about 6% relative to 21. Um, and in the coming year, as I shared earlier, Jubilee is set to top over 100,000 barrels a day gross uh, in the second half. And that's really when the Jubilee Southeast uh, development comes on stream. And, and that sort of more than offsets uh, the expected decline that we see in 10 uh, and the, and the non-output portfolio. So I think in aggregate, it sets us up for a pretty strong uh, both the second half of 23 and 23 performance. Let me move on to a really another important topic, which is as an operations led company, um, <clears throat> the focus on safety is really integral to, um, to how we work. So in 22, we had no injuries uh, in our business and top quartile uh, process safety uh, performance. And, and these just don't happen. I mean, they're underpinned by actions that we're taking and also around building a strong and safety culture. Uh, so what happens at the operations team, they develop pretty detailed plans. We learn from every incident. And also we keep track of what are called near misses, no ma matter how small they are. And you complement that, you support that with a fit for purpose assurance program. 
So that provides all the right checks and balances. Um, so what the result of that is a continuous learning culture um, where every accident is preventable and every day it represents an improvement in the day before. Uh, that's really important because it's a foundation that underpins our focus on operational excellence. So maybe that's a good segue into let me talk about uh, the operational excellence. And what you've seen really over the past three years has been a steady improvement in uptime. And, and that really illustrates that journey that we're on. Um, I'm really proud of the team. They continue to do a fantastic job in delivering high production efficiency and maximizing production. And it's demonstrating this mantra that we have, which is that every battle matters a ton. Um, a you know, big thing last year for us was we successfully transferred the operation and maintenance uh, of the FPSO and Jubilee, which is of course our prized asset from an external contractor to our, our operating team. And the impact of that is really uh, immediate. You can see in between the first and the second half, uh, we've seen safety, reliability, uh, performance very, very strong, uh, but also we've seen running costs to come down. And this is a major, major step for us in supporting the vision that we have of Tullo being a low cost operator. Um, so for me, I think what's been also uh, very energizing really through this experience has been, you know, kind of a fundamental change in morale in the attitude and the ownership of the operating team. And what that's resulted in is you can see then kind of visible improvements in how we control work, in the housekeeping of the FPSOs, uh, the orderliness, and, and also importantly, kind of the general positivity uh, of the FPSO. Let me now talk about <clears throat> kind of how we're delivering the kind of plan to deliver the 100,000 pounds a day in Jubilee. So you may recall this in 70, since, since April 21, we've been started, restarted the investment program in Jubilee and we brought uh, seven bells on stream. And <clears throat> that's kind of really driven production from probably about the back end of 2020 was at about 70,000 barrels a day to an average for this year of 95,000 barrels a day. That's quite a remarkable achievement for a field that's kind of in midlife. So it speaks to the quality of the asset, but it also speaks to the rigor uh, of our investment program and also the operating discipline that I talked about. Now this year, the focus is on the completion of the subsea in infrastructure in the Eastern part of Jubilee. Um, that's largely undeveloped. Uh, so that completion becomes a catalyst to bring these undeveloped resources on the street. And just to give you a sense that infrastructure has got basically production manifolds and think about large kind of pipes uh, on the seabed, water injection manifolds uh, and related pipelines. And this along with the drilling of 11 wells uh, was about a billion dollar gross project that was sanctioned in 2020. Um, so the total cost really $1.1 billion it remains very much in line despite the inflationary uh, conditions. And, uh, and overall, the project is progressing in line with our expectations. So that further kind of uh, underpins or, or illustrates uh, the capability that we're building in the organization uh, around not just operations and drilling, but also around brownfield ex execution. So the plan in Jubilee Southeast is to complete uh, four wells this year. That's going to drive the step change in production. Uh, but there's a deep inventory. There's another seven bells planned uh, over the next, next couple of years in that. So, like I said, the first oil from Jubilee is going to be a significant milestone. Uh, and we're looking forward to that in the second half of the year. Um, <clears throat> let me focus on, uh, on 10, really, where the, you know, what the effort that we had in 22 was really on reservoir management. And we've been Again, able the demonstrated impact of that has been a reduction in the annual decline rates. Um, so in 22, the decline rates were less than half that, that we had in 2021. Now we've got no wells planned in 23. So our focus will be on active reservoir management and making sure we sustain the very strong operating performance. So we've had 98 plus percent uptime and improving the gas handling in the FPSO uh, for this year. So there's a planned shutdown uh, as well in the second half of the year. Uh, what is true in 10 is that there is a lot of complexity, but there's also a very significant undeveloped resource base uh, across the various accumulations of 10. And we're planning to monetize these resources through a combination of infill drilling, through phased development of new areas near the existing infrastructure, and also developing some very significant gas resources, uh, and also drilling prospective resources. So, we're working on a comprehensive 
plan and development that will capture all of these opportunities and that the plan is to submit that to the government of Ghana uh, later this year. And our hope is that you draw a line under the kind of bad news, if you will, on 10, uh, which seems to have a disproportionate impact on the narrative uh, and set ourselves up to uh, positive increments uh, once the plan of development is clear and, 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 and laid out. Uh, in addition to this effort, we're also looking to restructure the cost base uh, of PFPS as we go forward. Let me now move on to talking about Gabon and, uh, and Cote d'Ivoire. So Gabon is very interesting because we have uh, <clears throat> an inventory of kind of opportunities, which is really infrastructure linked, uh, call it exploration opportunities. And Simba probably is the best illustration of that. So the first kind of Simba appraisal well was drilled back in late 2018 and put on stream in 2019. And, and these are the sort of wells they pay back within months. And then the, uh, since then, I think in the end of 2021, we drilled Simba 3. That was as part of an expansion project that was put on stream uh, early in 22, and that's paid off. Now, of course, Simba is now in, in is mature. Those, those, those wells are mature. Uh, and so it's in decline, but we're planning a number of new prospects that have been matured. So we're planning some new exploration in, in that later this year or early next year. Uh, in addition to that, in, in, uh, in Gabon around the Chitamba area, we've identified a number of, of opportunities uh, where we have infrastructure and we can bring new fields on stream uh, relatively quickly. And that includes the Wamba discovery where we're doing a long-term production test. Um, in Cote d'Ivoire, really the big focus for us is, and you see this in the chart on the two blocks that are sit on the Kanagana Cote d'Ivoire border, uh, these are really an extension of the same play from Jubilee and 10 into Cote d'Ivoire. So we feel like we're best placed uh, to really sort of, you know, develop, explore and develop this. Uh, in fact, we're planning for an exploration well in CI524 uh, in, uh, in, 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 in 2024. Let me move on to uh, just a, uh, some thoughts on the kind of strategy as well. Uh, and the main thing really, in some ways, we're a very simple company, right? So you have this deleveraging story from the cash generation, which is de-risk with the Jubilee Southeast coming on stream in the second half. And then we have a number of near-term capitalists and each one of these can unlock very material value. So in Kenya, we submitted a couple of weeks ago, uh, the final field development plan for approval to the government. And we expect that the, this kicks off the FDP approval process, including ratification of uh, uh, by the parliament to conclude late, later this year. And in parallel, we're continuing to progress the farm down to a strategic uh, partner. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're focusing on a long-term supply agreement for indigenous gas. And this is important for Ghana because it not just enhances energy security, but it also facilitates industrial development. And at the same time, would unlock value from a very substantial gas resource base for us. Uh, the exploration strategy very much, as you heard me talk about in the context of Gabon and Cote d'Ivoire, very much focused around our producing assets in West Africa, where we have a deep understanding of the geoscience and, of course, existing infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have uh, some very large prospective resources in Guyana and Argentina, and we're really we're continuing to looking at opportunities to unlock that. So when you look at all of this, uh, really what we've done is we created a platform of assets and a set of ca capabilities that I would submit to you is quite unique in the sector. Uh, and I think as we de-lever, we create some financial flexibility that will also, I think, position us to consider additional opportunities for growth. So I think the, the, the interesting thing with this is that the action plans around all of these are pretty well defined. I think the delivery for each of these catalysts is embedded in our KPIs. Uh, so there's a clear path in terms of how we're going to get, get this done. So I think as you look in sort of conclusion, uh, you know, Richard showed this as well, you know, 22 has really been a strong, a you know, very strong financial uh, operational and drilling performance. And there's been, you know, coupled with significant progress on the delivery of the, uh, of the Jubilee Southeast project. So overall, where we are today in terms of the delivery is well ahead of the plans that we had set out uh, late in 2020. Uh, and it certainly builds on the success that we had in 2021. I think the performance really underscores the deep potential in the asset base. Uh, and also, I, I'm sure you'll agree, it's to, it demonstrates the strong commitment of the team to deliver value from that. Um, 
as Richard shared, kind of last year, at the end of last year, the balance sheet was quite strong. We had liquidity over a over billion dollars and gearing was at 1.3. I think 23 will deliver tangible results with a material step up in free cash flow in the second half of 2023, and that will help accelerate deleveraging. And of course, as we delever, we accrete equity value. Uh, and my submission to you is that that accretion process uh, is now de-raised. I think it's fair to say that business is undervalued on all metrics. It's largely due to a perceived uh, debt overhang. I think Richard, and I, Richard in particular spent a lot of time talking to both equity and debt investors, so we can share insights from that as well in the Q&A. I think as the hedges roll off, you'll see uh, significant upside to the oil prices. It doesn't feel that way right now, but, but certainly we're, we, we see where the world having significantly underinvested. Uh, there is a kind of structural uplift to oil prices. I think that, that that is widely anticipated. I think with a strong balance sheet, you got visible and accelerated deleveraging. I think this is the year that people will stop worrying about debt at Tello. And I think that's going to be a major game changer for the stock price. Um, and beyond that, of course, is the impact of individually and cumulatively of all the catalysts that I just highlighted in the previous slide. So you can see kind of why we as a management team, as a, as a team at Teller, really excited about it. It's very compelling and it's a very unique proposition that Teller offers today. And I would just say, look, you know, the teams work really hard. They continue to work really hard. They believe in the business. And it, I really want to thank all of, all of our, our colleagues for their, for their commitment and the delivery. I think we're also uh, very grateful to the host nations. It's a complex relationship, but, but we work well. And the it means I think there's a general sense of support from around wherever we work. Uh, and also kind of to our shareholders, to all of you and our, 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 our debt investors for your confidence in us. So I think with that, let me stop here. I think uh, Alex has been, he's got a lot of questions, I think, for Richard and I, so happy to take those. Yes, thank you, Rahul and, and Richard, for that uh, presentation. I'm glad to hear about that, the strong financial and operational performance you've uh, posted in 2022. Uh, we have had a, a lot of questions, so we'll try and get through as uh, many as we can. Uh, the first one starts off that you've owned the Guiana and Orindike assets for a long time, and it's difficult to see much progress there. Is it time for someone else to progress this asset? Should you be perhaps considering an exit? And when and how could this happen? Well, thank you. I think um, our strategy in, in Latin America is very clear. These are large prospective resources in emerging basins. Um, we do not plan to allocate a lot of capital to these. The idea is to try and find appropriate partners where we can retain an interest uh, on a carried basis without spending a lot of capital, right? Now, the last few years, well, particularly around COVID time and all was, a, was not the most ideal time to be looking for, for far, far more partners. I think as the oil prices um, have stabilized at higher levels, uh, exploration is coming back. We certainly see this is the right time to be looking for partners. Um, so yes, I think we, we certainly would be looking for partners, but while retaining some exposure to the upside. Okay, thank you. Um, what do management think the market needs to see in order to put the equities price where it deserves? So uh, look, let me give you kind of my perspective a little bit, and I think I'll hand over to Richard because he's done a lot of work and thinking on this. Um, I, look, I, you know, my sense is that you know trust is easy to lose and hard to build, and I think what we have done and will continue to do is to deliver and to build that trust, right? And I think that we're reaching that point where people are, you know, we were seeing an institutional investor last week, I think it was. Um, and, and the general feedback from, from some of these people was that they no longer see us as a turnaround situation. So that's gratifying. Um, so I think certainly, you know, continuing delivery, embedding all the kind of discipline around cost, operational excellence in the culture so that that's not something that people worry about. I think that's quite key, but there's a more specific answer to that, which uh, I'll invite Richard to share. Yeah, th th thank, thanks, Rahul. I think the sort of the, the biggest piece of feedback that we sort of, I suppose, consistently get is around um, the perceived risk on the balance sheet. So obviously we've been on a 
um, a profile of cash generation over the last couple of years. We've you know, delivered over $500 million of deleveraging. As you look forward, there's another $800 million of free cash flow at $80 a barrel. And I think as Rahul mentioned earlier, you know, it is at what point does that our past delivery and sort of current progress de-risk the future? Because, you know, from where we sit today from a total um, net debt position of 1.9, we have gearing of 1.3 times, you know, that's still slightly higher than where we'd like it to be. But we now are on that platform for continual reduction. So as Rahul mentioned, the, the the, the sort of the key thing from an equity um, perception perspective will be when people stop being concerned around the debt position. So, um, you know, we just need to continue to work hard. We've got a number of options available to us um, in terms of refinancing. Our next maturity is not until March 25. Um, so our ability to be proactive and address that maturity uh, in advance on, you know, terms that are sort of accretive for the company I think it will be one of the events that, you know, begins to change that perception on, on the equity value of the company. Okay, thank you. Um, I think you mentioned some of this in your answer there, Rahul, but it's a separate question here, which is, looks like it's linked. And the question is, would you still say that you're turning around the company or have you moved into recovery mode? And when do you go move to um, growth or capital return? So I, I think, look, in business, I've learned you're never complacent, right? Every day you're trying to be a little bit better than the year than the day before. Um, but having said that, I feel pretty good about where we are as a company, given you know the focus on for the last two, two and a half three years on on cost reduction, on uh, on operating performance, drilling, uh, delivery of the project. So I feel I would say that look. And given that we're ahead of where our plans were, I feel pretty good about that. Um, so in a kind of turnaround sense, I think that what the investors kind of said to us, which is they no longer see us as a turnaround story, I think that's, that's in part answer to the question. Um, I think the focus very much for us in 23 is on delivery, on embedding that sort of ethos within the, within the culture of the company to make sure that's sustained. Um, I think it's very much about growth in the sense that we're delivering organic growth uh, from our assets. So we talked at length about Jubilee uh, Southeast, but also a number of the other catalysts. So I think we certainly have line of sight on a number of organic growth opportunities. Um, and I think I also said that we're well positioned uh, if inorganic opportunities come along. We're quite a unique company in Africa, given the relationships we have, given the the operating track record that we have created. So I think that opportunity is there. And then also, I think as we get to kind of getting targets of below one times, that's the time you start looking at, uh, at, at, at shareholder return as well. So I think I would say, you know, feeling good about where we are as it kind of stabilizes the business, embedding continuous improvement, a number of very visible organic growth opportunities, well positioned for inorganic, and then as we delever, uh, we'd like to be in a position where we can turn capital shareholders. Brilliant, thank you. Got a couple of quite specific questions on some assets. So the first one's regarding the Ghana gas agreement. What's the time scale for signing this agreement with the Ghanaian government and will it be backdated? So the, um, I think there is a, I, I can't give you kind of a precise time frame because having worked in Africa for over a decade, it's hard to predict precise timeframes. Um, what I can say is that there is a real um, imperative uh, from the government of Ghana to get the gas sales agreement done. And the reason being, you'll remember last year with the Russia-Ukraine crisis or war, uh, a lot of the LNG from around the world is flowing into Western Europe. Right. So countries like Ghana actually have been very adversely impacted by that because they were counting on LNG supply for power generation. So it's creating a shortfall and energy shortage, if you will, in the country. So, so there's a real imperative from the government to try and get an agreement done quickly. Uh, so I'm encouraged by that. I won't unfortunately be able to give you um, a precise uh, time frame on that. Um, the second part of the question, Alex, was 
there were, well, I don't think there was a second part of the question. I guess, okay. no, will, it, will, it be, will it be backdated? Okay, no, it, well, it's, it wouldn't be backdated because I think you would have seen that the foundation gas, which is the free gas arrangement that dated back, I think over a decade, that ended in December. And currently we have a provisional interim gas agreement, uh, which is nominal price of about 50 cents uh, per MCF. Uh, and that's going to carry on through about mid-year. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to Kenya, is the uh, company negotiating the farm down um, totally tied to the FID or are there other issues? So uh, it's, what's interesting is that if you look back in over the last year or so, I guess, since we've been uh, discussing the farm out, um, two or three things. So one is you're dealing uh, with governments on both sides, the Kenyan government and potential farmanese. Most of the people we're talking to are national oil companies. So that in itself uh, is a process that's slow. Uh, second is that a lot of the, the NOCs, particularly in Asia last year, were distracted with what was happening in Russia, which was creating opportunities for them. So that was another factor. The third is we had elections in Kenya, so there was really no government in place. <clears throat> for people to engage with. I think that's obviously changed now. We have a very active president. We have a minister in place who knows their project in the sector well. Um, so they're pretty engaged now. And, uh, and that was evidenced obviously with us submitting the field development plan, the final version uh, a couple of weeks ago. And a real desire on the government to try and get the FDP, the field development plan approved. Um, while there's no explicit linkage between the FDP approval and the, the, the farm done, but obviously a potential farm and e, if you were an investor coming into the project, you'd want to see uh, the shape of the final field development plan as well before kind of finalizing the improvement. So, so there, is, there is some linkage there. Um, and just one point of clarification, the field development plan submission back in December 21 was an important a milestone in protecting the license. So we have the license. Uh, what we're, we're discussing with the Kenyan government now is the idea of an FID, which would be separate from a field development plan uh, approval. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, question here relates back to some, uh, I guess, historical trading updates. So in January 22, you initially guided 25 million underlying free cash flow excluding one-off payments from Total. And then in the latest trading update, January 23, you mentioned that underlying free cash flow in 22 would have been 393 million, also excluding the 75 million you received from Total and excluding the payments you made to Norwegian arbitration of 76 and adjusted for the 126 million consideration for the preemption transaction in Ghana. Um, and, and the question is, how is it possible to get such a big discrepancy? And uh, I guess why we, I guess, underestimate the figures back in January 22. Thank you. Maybe Richard, do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. So look, the, the original free cash flow guidance um, that we set out in January 22 was based on $75 a barrel. Um, so one of the biggest drivers between where we finished up at the end of 22, which is $267 million, um, was an uplift in oil prices. So we saw our sort of realized price pre-hedging um, was just shy of $105 a barrel. So there was a $20 uplift in market oil prices between what we guided initially and where the outturn was. Um, the two other things that sort of impacted that was um, firstly, our management of costs. Um, so during the year, we sort of exceeded our expectations and ability to continue to reduce costs. Um, and also we had some deferrals of some decommissioning work in Mauritania that moved from 22 into 23. Um, so they were the, the biggest drivers. I think one element of the question also referred to Ghana preemption. So that was $126 million that went out last year, but it paid itself back within nine months. So at the end of the year, that payment was actually cash flow positive. So it sort of positively contributed to, uh, I suppose, the, the increase in guidance. So in summary, oil prices, main driver, sort of able to exceed our expectations on cost and then a bit of deferring of decommissioning expenditure. Okay, thank you. And then sort of looking forward to 2023, um, you're guiding 
free cash flow of just 100 million at $80 a barrel, um, are you trying to be accurate or conservative? Richard? <laughs> but, yeah, it's 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 very much accurate. I mean, that that's you know, it's based on guidance of eighty dollars a uh, a barrel. Look, we've seen where we are at the moment. I mean, we're currently seeing prices around um, seventy two. But as Rahul said, you know, there's a wider market expectation that prices could be higher in the second half of the year. Look, we, whenever we set our guidance, it's based on the most likely outcome. We will work as hard as we can to to sort of deliver better than that but obviously that you know there's underlying risks within the business as well so it's very much mm -hmm. the best estimate so some of the catalysts you outline have been similar for a number of years now what has materially changed now to make you state that these realistic near-term catalysts rather than continue to be aspirational catalysts so i think the again you know projects or some of these don't necessarily lend themselves to calendar years. Um, so as I run through the catalyst, I think the 10 plan of development really is a culmination of, you know, a couple of years worth of work really in terms of understanding the complexity of the reservoir, uh, you know, a processing of additional kind of 4D seismic data, uh, some disappointments, the two wells we drilled in the riser base. So all of that has been factored in to the planning development. So that candidly is kind of is a new thing. Uh, similarly, I think the imperative on the gas sales agreement really kicked off uh, kind of mid last year, uh, given, you know, the, the impending kind of gas shortage in Ghana. So, so that's really, you know, we were hoping we would get, uh, you know, an agreement kind of in place, uh, you know, potentially kind of late last year, but that's kind of slipped into into 23. So, uh, and Kenya again, the real impetus there, as I explained earlier, was was starting last year. Um, and given the all the factors that I explained, I think it's easy to see why we're kind of focusing on that for for this year. So, I think there are pretty good reasons for feeling good about all of these catalysts uh, this year. Uh, but again, look, these are catalysts, right? So they they could happen, they could not happen. I think um, what we're trying to do is be transparent around the opportunity. And I think recognize that any one of these or each one of these individually can have quite a material impact on the share price. Okay, thank you. Got a couple of questions on oil price hedges. So one is, what are your expectations for realized price after hedging for 2023? And the, and the sort of link question to that, do the bank's debt requirements require the company to hedge some of your oil? And if yes, what percentage of that? Richard, would you please take that? Yeah, so look, the the, realize, the realization for 23, so our guidance is $80 a barrel. Um, and you know our sort of uh, the sort of the the calls on the on our existing hedge portfolio sort of average at seventy five dollars um, a barrel for the for most of um, twenty three. So the the real the actual realization between um, based on a market price of eighty will be slightly south of eighty, but not 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 too different. Um, in terms of um, what the banks require us to do, so when we sort of did our last refinancing in 2021, we had a, a static requirement. So it required us for three years post the anniversary of um, taking out that financing um, to hedge 75%, 75% and 50% for those three calendar years. That's not a rolling requirement. It was a static requirement. So. Um, we've started to see, as you can see from one of the, the gra uh, graphs in the pack, you, you start to see our hedge book start to roll off. Um, look, we're obviously, you know, this volatility that you can see in pricing at the moment will continue to hedge point forwards, but we'll very much do it on a sort of a rateable opportunistic basis over a period of time to build up a, a sensible layer of hedging to provide us with that core downside protection for when we do see volatility, but provide us with access to oil prices. You know, it pains us all to pay out $320 million to the banks last year, but it was, you know, essential as part of the refinancing. Thank you. Um, around 75% of your producing assets are in Ghana, which is a country that has defaulted on its debt. 
What is the risk for tallow oil from higher taxes and other new measures? So I think what's important is um, to recognize that our business in Ghana, Gabon, pretty much everywhere we work is uh, on the basis of petroleum agreements or production sharing contracts. Right? And I've worked emerging markets most of my career and that's a pretty standard uh, contractual framework. It's different by the way from what happens in the UK. Right? And what's unique about or what's, what's particular common across all of these petroleum agreements, uh, including the one in Ghana, are three things. One is they provide for fiscal stability. And what that means is that the tax uh, regime, the fiscal regime prevailing at the time of when you sign the contract is the one that will prevail through the life of the contract. So that fiscal stability provision is very, very critical. Uh, the second is they provide for international arbitration of disputes. And the third is they protect you from enforcement actions uh, whilst you have disputes. And this is not just unique to, to ours. And, and, and like, for example, in Ghana, our petroleum agreement has the force of law because it's approved by the Ghanaian parliament, right? So I think what's key to understand um, whether we're in Ghana or any other country that we operate in is the robustness of those, of those protections uh, that you have, which are underpinned by, by, the internet, by the ability to go to international arbitration. Okay, thank you. Uh, question here on directors buying of stock. You know, I guess it's a statement here, which is re regular significant director buys would be reassuring when you've got oil at $72 and falling in the share price at 26. Uh, I guess the question is, would you agree with that? Or what are your thoughts on the directors buying of stock? Yeah, look, I think that we've been keen to buy. I mean, I, I own uh, stock myself, but we've talked about this at the board as well. I think the windows typically as a public company, you have uh, a window when let's say there is no material non-public information the directors own uh, and you are a disclosure of windows. Unfortunately, since the last year, uh, we've been in, in, in closed windows, whether it was Capricorn, whether it's other, other situations. So we've not really had that open window, but what I can assure you is that there is a very strong desire uh, for people to have skin in the game, uh, including our chair. Uh, and, uh, and it's just a question of getting that right window. But yes, no, I think we, we, I would agree with you. Not, not just from a kind of optics of it, but look, as an investment proposition, um, you know, I mean, we're, we're committed with our, our lives in this, this, this company, but I do think that, that I, you know, we believe there is, a, there is a real compelling value in this business. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here on the Ghanaian tax dispute. So one question is, has the dispute with the Ghanaian tax authorities been settled? Um, and the other question is, can you discuss and explain the several tax issues you have against the government of Ghana? Are these potential liabilities that you haven't disclosed? So I think Richard's done a really good job of kind of disclosing all of that in the, in the results, but Richard, maybe you can talk through um the different uh categories and how we see them please yeah sure um so yeah we've there's look there's three um sort of um primary disputes that are currently sort of within arbitration um so we've got um the branch profits remittance tax which is the first um claim that we took to arbitration back in 2021 um that's for 320 million dollars um, we then took another two claims to international arbitration in February of this year. Um, so both around $190 million. One is for uh, interest deductibility and the other one is an um, assessment of uh, business interruption insurance proceeds. Um, so they're the sort of, uh, I suppose, the three claims that we have within arbitration. There are sort of a number of other items that sort of resulted from the uh, 2014 to 16 audit. Um, it's pretty, um, as Rahul said, sort of well disclosed within our um, results statement. Um, the sort of the, the total sort of contingent liability number that we have is around 1.1 billion. We're obviously incredibly confident of our position, which is why there's no material provision on our balance sheet in respect of these claims. And it's just part of the process that we need to work through point forwards. Um, and I think in terms of the first aspect of the question, have any of them been settled? Um, not to date, no. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, looking at, at the balance sheet here, you, you say that you have a strong balance sheet, um, but actually you've got 1.9 billion of debt and the bonds are trading the market as if the company has defaulted um, with yields around 25 uh, to 30%. Um, could you comment on, on, I guess, the strength of the balance sheet in that context of those uh, those numbers? Yeah, look, I, I think the numbers from uh, from both the gearing, so it's not, it's the absolute debt is, is 1.9 net debt, but the, but the gearing is 1.3 and the liquidity as Richard said. And the other side of it, which is this paradox, right? Which is, I think what creates the opportunity is the bonds are trading at whatever, 60, 65 cents on the dollar. This is the 25, the, the, the unsecured. Um, again, I think Richard spends a lot of time thinking about this. So he's probably a better place to answer this than I am, Richard. Yeah, so look, I mean, I, I think from a balance sheet perspective, as Rahul, as you mentioned, you know, we it's $1.9 billion of total debt. You know, as we set out in the uh, presentation today, uh, you know, $80 a barrel will be generating $800 million of free cash flow over the next three years. You know, that takes us down to $1.1 billion worth of debt, and that's only on a 2P basis as well. So it doesn't include the cash flow generation capacity of the catalyst. You know, we'll be at one times gearing either by the end of this year or by the end of 24 oil price dependent. So you're going into a refinancing with, you know, a bit over a billion dollars of net debt, one times gearing and an asset value, which is also the other important element of the equation, like how much of our assets worth, you know, and they that close to it sits close to four billion dollars at the moment. So you know, I know this is what Rahul mentioned, you know, that inflection point when the comfort of our and confidence in the ability for the company to deliver that free cash flow in the, me, uh, the medium term, you know, we've proved it so far. We've delivered $500 million um, over the last couple of years. But obviously, you know, it's important that we carry on that trajectory. You know, that's that point in time. And as Rahul said, you know, it's a massive opportunity from an equity value perspective because of, you know, where the company sits at the moment. And look, in terms of the bonds and where they're trading, um, look, they um, they're trading at significant discounts. It, it's you know one of the um, one of the the factors that sort of um, sort of you know makes it sort of difficult for new people to start investing in the equity at the moment. You know, we're pretty confident that we have a um, a number of options to be able to address the maturities. And as we start to be able to pull the trigger on some of those options, then, you know, we're pretty confident then the bonds will get to a far more normal trading prices. I mean, they're, they're not particularly liquid in instruments at the moment in terms of, you know, the ability to, to get them and the prices on the screen. Interesting. We've got a sort of follow up question specifically on the bonds, which says that they're trading at a significant discount at the moment. Um, um, why aren't you using your liquidity to buy back the bonds? No, it's a really good question. I mean, we, they obviously, as a, you know, as a, an element to secure some value, you know, both create equity value and, and also be able to uh, show confidence. It's, uh, it's a, a sort of one lever that we have to pull. But uh, as I mentioned, we've got a number of options available to us to be able to address our maturities. You know, when we spend our cash, we can only spend it once. So it's really important that we, um, I suppose, pull the lever in the right way at the right time, you know, for the, for, for in a way that is, you know, not, doesn't just work for, uh, for our debt holders, but is also value accretive for our equity holders as well. Brilliant. And I think we've got uh, one time for one last question here. And this one is looking forward. And what are your expectations and hopes for 2024 and 2025 uh, once Jubilee Southeast is on stream in terms of production, capex, and, and cash flow, so quite a quite a big question. But uh, hopefully, you can you can cover cover that. Well, I, th I think we, I mean the Richard's given guidance on kind of a two P basis. So I think I would, if I if you permit me, answer it less from a quantitative point of view. But but I think the vision that we have, right, and I think that may be useful is to say, look, you come in twenty four, um, you've de-risked the business, you're at over one hundred thousand barrels a day on Jubilee, you've got a plan of development that you've submitted, the government has approved it, um, which means that you've got a clear path on 10 as you go forward. You've got a gas sales agreement in place, which is delivering value, allows you to book reserves um, <clears throat> and generate additional cash flow. You've got a clear plan of forward on Kenya. 
maybe you farmed out something in Guyana or Argentina uh, and you've drilled some, some good exploration wells, or, you know, whether it's in Cote d'Ivoire uh, or, in, or in Gabon. So I think that's a very clear kind of vision we have where we want to take the business in organically in 24. I think if I build on top of that from a financial point of view, we'd say, look, there is a very clear kind of path on refinancing. People have stopped worrying about debt on Tello. Um, and I think as we if, if you if you were to go in a time machine and go to 24, so this time next year, um, if people have stopped worrying about the debt, we have the financial flexibility, maybe we've done something inorganic. Uh, to add some compelling value. So I think it's not, I mean, I've, I've been CEO for since 2006 of various businesses. I think it's not, I mean, very rarely do you find in life that you have a very clear path of what you need to do uh, to deliver value, right? And I think we're in that, in that point. And I think it's very rarely do you find yourself at an inflection point and what I say to the team, if we have a Monday morning call, so we had a session today as well. And in some ways, when you look at the, the market, um, it can be sort of concerning. But I think what we as a team are doing is saying, look, we're very clear about what needs to get done. We're very clear about the value of our business. And we're confident as we deliver that, that value will come through, right? And I think that's the submission uh, I would say to you from a kind of investment proposition uh, for Tunnel. Brilliant. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar with, with Tello Oil. Rahul and uh, Richard, thank you very much for a um, clear presentation, I think an upbeat presentation, and also for answering all those questions so comprehensively. So I know that's really appreciated. So thank you for that. And for all our audience, thank you for attending. Um, I'd like to just mention that when you leave today, there will be some uh, feedback questions that will be asked. And if you could complete those, uh, we very much appreciate that. And then just to flag up um, a couple of webinars we've got coming up tomorrow at 20, tomorrow the 21st of March, we've got IMI. Next week uh, on the 28th, both Ken Mayer and Lloyds Banking Group. And then into May, we've got uh, Sainsbury's and details of all of those on the Yellowstone Advisory webinar uh, website. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you for Rahul and Richard, and we hope okay. to see you all soon. Take care. All the best, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you.